Welcome to the WISE introduction to the Pearson Chi-Square test. Uh, there are two WISE videos on the Pearson Chi-Square statistic. This first video describes how the test works, how it's related to the parametric chi-square distribution, and how we can apply it to scientific questions. Uh, the second video describes tests of independence. Um, I'd like to start with some background. Toward the end of the last century, uh, the end of the 1900s, the American Association for the Advancement of Science published uh, an article on the 20 discoveries that had that changed our lives. They had the greatest impact on, on our lives in the last century. Uh, it's an impressive list. Antibiotics, aviation, plastics. There's one item on this list, though, that really caught my attention. Pearson's chi-square test. Now, what is Pearson's chi-square test, this humble statistical test, doing on this list of scientific discoveries that changed our lives? Well, the rationale is that prior to 1900, uh, when Pearson published his test, scientists didn't have any standard method for assessing how well their data matched uh, their theory. Uh, but Pearson's statistic opened the door. Uh, and it led to sweeping changes in the way that scientists analyze their data. And so Pearson's uh, membership on this list rec recognizes that kind of transformation because with Pearson's test, the chi-square uh, test, hypotheses could be tested objectively, evidence could be quantified. Uh, Pearson's chi-square test uh, is often called a goodness of fit test. Uh, it compares observed frequencies to expected frequencies. So let's uh, look at an application. Back in the 1800s, uh, the good monk uh, Gregor Mendel studied uh, transmission of characteristics from one generation to the next. And he used P's uh, to study this. So in one type of study, he would have uh, plants that uh, produced yellow peas. For many generations, the, these plants produced only yellow peas, and another line of peas that produced only green peas. What he found is when he crossbred these, the offspring were all yellow. All the peas were yellow. But when he crossbred uh, peas from this first generation, hybrid generation, all of the offspring were not yellow. Some of them were green, and most of them were yellow, but some of them were green. Now, Mendel developed a theory that there were factors underlying this that could be recessive or, or, or dominant. And his theory was that one-fourth of the second generation peas should be green, three-fourths should be yellow. Well, how would you test that? Uh, the theory is one-fourth will be green. Uh, so he ran an experiment. And so, for example, if uh, he might grow 800 independent plants from this second generation, and by independent we mean that they weren't peas that came from the same pod or even from the same plant, uh, he would have 800 independent um, uh, peas from independent plants. Now suppose that when he did that, he observed, say, 212 of the plants had green peas, 588 had yellow peas. Uh, is this consistent with the theory? Well, for Mendel, uh, he was left with pretty much hand-waving and saying, well, you know, you might expect a quarter of them, 800, you'd expect 200 to be uh, green, 212, that's pretty close, don't you think? Let's, let's put this information into a table where we can see it more clearly. Here we have the total number of peas was 800, 212 were green, 588 were yellow. To generate the expected frequencies, we would begin by taking that 800 and calculating then how many of that 800 would you expect would be green. Well, we expect one-fourth of them would be green, one-fourth of 800 is 200. Once we have that number, the other number is can be found by subtraction is 600. Now, Pearson's statistic looks like this. It looks kind of complicated maybe at first glance, but it's really pretty uh, intuitive. The working part of it is looking at the observed frequency for a category minus the expected frequency. Square that number, divide by the expected, 
and do that for each category, add them up, and we have Pearson's chi-square statistic. Uh, so let's do that. For the first category, the observed was 212. We expected 200. Difference is 12. Square that, we get 144. 144 divided by 200 is 0.72. Do the same thing for the second category, uh, and now it's negative 12 is the discrepancy, and we get a, to a number of 0.24. Add those together, we get 0.96. So in our example then, Pearson's chi-square statistic is 0.96. Now, the beauty of Pearson's chi-square statistic is that when we have satisfied certain conditions, that statistic is distributed close to the parametric chi-square distribution. Now, the parametric chi-square distribution is a nice continuous distribution, a mathematical distribution, you know, kind of like the normal distribution is a mathematical distribution, where we know probabilities under any given portion of the distribution. Pearson's statistic, on the other hand, is calculated off of the data. Now, this relationship between Pearson statistic and the chi-square is only true if three conditions are met. The first condition is that the theory is true. Now, the theory in our example is that one-fourth of the P's will be green. Uh, if the theory is not true, then the observed could be much uh, larger, much smaller, could be very far from the expected, and this statistic would not be distributed according to chi-square. The second condition is that the observations are random and independent. Uh, in our example, it means we don't take multiple p's from the same pod. Uh, we would have peas that were taken from separate plants uh, from the second generation plant, so they'd be independent. Uh, the third condition is that the expected frequencies are reasonably large. Uh, now the reason for that is if these expected frequencies are small, the Pearson chi-square statistic becomes really quite choppy. When the expected frequencies are large, uh, this Pearson statistic smooths out and approaches the uh, uh, parametric distribution much more closely. Now let's take a closer look at the parametric chi-square distribution. The chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom is a terrifically skewed distribution, uh, but we can calculate the probabilities of falling in any given region on this distribution. The, our question here would be, how likely is it to observe a chi-square of 0.96 or larger if the theory is correct and the assumptions are met? Well, 0.96 uh, falls down in this lower region. Uh, it's not a very, uh, it's not a very surprising value at all, it, it would seem. We can actually calculate that value more exactly by going to a computer program such as a uh, Statwise program is uh, an Excel spreadsheet that you can download off of the WISE website. But we can enter the calculated value 0.96 in the bottom, one degree of freedom, and then the program generates the p-value for the upper tail, 0.327. So we could summarize this as saying the probability of observing a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom larger than 0.96 is 0.327, about a third of a chance. Uh, so uh, if the theory is correct, getting a Pearson statistic this large or larger would happen about a third of the time. Uh, and so the data then are consistent with the theory. Not very surprising. Now, we haven't proven that their theory is correct, but we have shown that it's uh, tenable, that we have no evidence to reject that theory. You could put this in the form of a hypothesis testing, where the null hypothesis is that probabilities that a uh, P from the second generation is green is 0.25. The alternate hypothesis is that it's not 0.25. The result that we have from our statistical test is that the chi-square with one degree of freedom is equal to 0.96, p is equal to 0.327, so the probability is greater than 0.05. Uh, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. 
an other interpretation um, is that, again, we don't prove that the null hypothesis is correct, but we can't reject it. Now, notice that this test is a two-tailed test. We would have rejected this null hypothesis if we had found a difference in either direction because we're taking the observed minus the expected and squaring it. So discrepancy either greater or less than the expected value will generate a, a larger Pearson statistic. But you know, it's one tail on the chi-square distribution, but it gives us a two-tailed test in this case with one degree of freedom. Uh, let's look more closely at the relationship between the chi-square distribution and the normal distribution. Uh, now, the normal distribution you're probably familiar with. Uh, if we are doing two-tailed tests in the normal distribution, uh, to cut off the 5% level two-tailed test, uh, the critical value is 1.96. That is, there's a 5% chance that from a normal distribution we would observe a value larger than 1.96 or smaller than negative 1.96, two-tailed tests. The so sum of those two portions is 0.05. Now the relationship between the chi-square and the normal distribution is simply chi-square with one degree of freedom is equal to z squared. And we can see this easily with the critical values. If we square the z values, critical values, we'll see they map exactly onto the critical values for the chi-square distribution. Um, and you can kind of see this too, if you were to square the normal distribution values, most likely you get something close to zero, um, but you could get something uh, you know, much larger. Getting something as large as three would be quite unlikely. Three is equivalent to getting a nine on the chi-square distribution. Now, we've been talking about uh, chi-square with one degree of freedom equal to a z-square, a random z-score from a normal distribution, a random z-score from a normal distribution is chi-square, same thing. If you were to take two independent, separate z-scores from a normal distribution, square each one, add them together, you could generate a new distribution, and that is exactly the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. This can be generalized to um, as many degrees of freedom as you would like, uh, can be summarized in a nice little formula. Chi-square with k degrees of freedom is just the summation of k independent uh, z-squared scores from a normal distribution. Now, so there's a whole family of chi-square distributions. I'd like to show you a family portrait of some of the smaller members of the chi-square distribution. Uh, There's a beautiful little chart that I got from Wikipedia. Uh, the references are at the end of this um, presentation. Now, the first two distributions with one and two degrees of freedom have the most likely value is zero, close to zero. Um, but for the larger degrees of freedom, we can see that they move off to the right and that you can see why with more degrees of freedom, we're adding together more z-scores, the expected values will be getting larger and larger. There's some nice summary statistics here that I think are useful to know about and in particular the first one. The mean of a chi-square distribution is equal to its degrees of freedom. So what this means, if, if somebody tells you, oh, I found a chi-square of 10, is that impressive? Well, if you had one degree of freedom, a chi-square of 10 would be statistically significant. It would be a surprising value to get a chi-square of 10 off of one degree of freedom. But if you had 10 degrees of freedom, chi-square of 10 is right at the mean. Wouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, other statistics, other features of the chi-square distribution, um, the mode is interesting, I think. Uh, the mode is the highest value, the most likely single value. For one and two degrees of freedom, the mode is zero. But for larger degrees of freedom, the mode is equal to the degrees of freedom minus two. So for the chi-square with three degrees of freedom, the mode is at one. With four degrees of freedom, the mode is at two, and so forth. If you just want to draw one out or think about expectations, uh, uh, the mode is useful. Now, the variance, of course, gets larger. 
with more degrees of freedom, but skew and kurtosis get smaller with more degrees of freedom. And these formulas are, are kind of cute. They always have 8 and 12, no matter how many degrees of freedom you have. Uh, the skew is equal to the square root of 8 divided by degrees of freedom. So now as degrees of freedom are larger, the skew is smaller. It approaches 0. And the same with kurtosis. Uh, with more degrees of freedom, it approaches zero. Now, you may recall that a normal distribution has a skew of zero and kurtosis of zero. And it's the case that chi-square, with as the degrees of freedom get increasingly large, it approaches a normal distribution. Another relationship between chi-square and the normal distribution. Now, let's take a look at an ap another application uh, with uh, more categories. So suppose uh, we have a, a die, um, six-sided cube with uh, numbers one through six on the six sides. And the question is, is this die fair? Well, how could we test this? Um, we might just toss this die many times and observe whether we get about the equal number of of ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. So let's suppose we did that, toss it maybe 60 times, uh, and we get uh, some range of different kind of outcomes, 15, 9, so forth. Now, what would you have expected to get? How many ones would you have expected to get? Well, first we look at the total number of tosses. It's 60, 60 observations. We'd expect one out of six to be a one. Well, in other words, about 10. 10 would be the expected number for each of these. Now, are the observed results that we have surprising given this expectation? Well, we can use Pearson's statistic to test this. And uh, let's just look at, say, the first category. We take the observed 15 minus 10 gives us 5. Square that, get 25 divide by the expected value, 25 divided by 10 is 2.5. We can do that for each of the categories and we get a total then of 9.6. That is Pearson's statistic. But how many degrees of freedom do we have? Well, we've got a total here of six different statistics, we could say observed minus expected statistics that go into this computation. And so we might at first glance think, well, we have six degrees of freedom. But in fact, there are only five degrees of freedom. There are not six independent pieces of information. And the reason is the sum of these deviations is zero. Um, we've constrained it because we set the expect expectations around the observed. Uh, so we know that the deviations, uh, some of the deviations will be zero. The implication of that is we have only five pieces of independent information. If you tell me the first five deviations, there's no new information for the sixth one. I, I can calculate what that is. So there are really just five degrees of freedom here. Chi-square with five degrees of freedom uh, equal 9.6. So is this a surprising value? Well, we go to the um, Stat-wise, put in 9.6, 5 degrees of freedom, we get 0 0.087. So we can summarize this as chi-square with 5 degrees of freedom equal 9.6, p equal 0 0.087. So to interpret this, is this a surprising value? Well, if we're using 0 0.05 as our critical value for significance, our alpha value, we would say no, it does not attain statistical significance at the 0 0.05 level. We could say the evidence is not strong enough to reject the null hypothesis that the die is fair. We could say the data are consistent with the theory that the die is fair. But again, note we haven't proven that the die is fair, only we do not have evidence with these calculations that uh, it's not surprising. We don't have evidence to strong evidence to conclude that the die is not fair. Let's look at another situation though, where when the friend brought us the die, suppose the friend said, you know, I got this die from a gambling friend and I think he's a cheater. I think he shaved this die. Now by a shaved die, uh, it means that he might have shaved off some material from the six side and the one side to make 
uh, the other side's a little smaller so that the die would be more likely to land on a one or a six than the other uh, possible outcomes. And if you have that theory, we could test that theory. But now a real important point here is it wouldn't be fair to look at our observed data and say, oh, you know, it looks like we may have a few more ones and sixes. Let's test whether that's significant. Uh, we need new data. You, you could use data to generate a theory, make a hypothesis, but you need new data to test it. So let's suppose he had this theory before we collected the data. The model is a priori. And so now we're going to test whether the outcomes of a one or a six is surprisingly more common than you would have expected than uh, say two, three, four, or five. So what would you expect? How many ones or sixes would you expect? Well, we'd expect 10 ones and 10 sixes. We would expect 20 of them or a third of the 60 uh, and then 40 of the others. So the expected values are 20 and 40 for these two categories. Let's calculate Pearson's statistic. Uh, for the first category, we take observed minus expected. 31 minus 20 gives us 11. Square the 11, get 121. 121 divided by the expected, which is 20, and that gives us 6.05. Same calculation for the 2 through 5. The deviation is in the opposite direction, negative 11, and we get a calculation then of 3.03 .03. added together we get 9.08. Now how many degrees of freedom do we have in this case? Well we have actually only two categories here and we really only have one piece of information about how observed deviates from the expected. Uh, we get the 11 and then the other one is negative 11 so we have one degree of freedom. So how surprising is it to get a chi-square of 9.08 if you have one degree of freedom? We can go to our chi-square distribution and see where does that 9.08 fall, and it's out here pretty far. We can go to the WISE uh, stat program, calculate the probability, it's 0.0026. So to interpret this, the conclusion is we have observed significantly more ones and sixes than expected if the die is fair. We could reject our null hypothesis that we have a fair die. Um, so this is an example where a good theory gives us more power than the first theory, which was just maybe there's something uh, going on here with all six categories when we can simp when we can focus it more sharply on ones and sixes versus a two, three, four, five, we have more sensitivity. Okay, uh, the next example is a, a kind of an unusual application, but I think it's useful for uh, understanding how chi-square works and, and kind of applications you can make. It goes back to Mendel's data. After Pearson published his statistic, Fisher went back and reanalyzed Mendel's data. And if, here would be an example of a study from Mendel where he uh, had second generation yellow peas. Now his theory would say that one third of them would not have a recessive uh, green factor and two thirds of them would. Uh, and to test them then he took all these yellow peas or a set of yellow peas, in this case 1,084 yellow peas from a second generation and then grew each one of these peas through many generations. And I think he would do like 10 generations to see whether over 10 generations did the pea have only yellow offspring or did it occasionally have a green offspring. And if it had a green offspring, it would fall into the second category. If it never had a green offspring, it'd stay in the yellow category. Now, how many would you expect in each of these categories? Well, if you have a total of 1,084, expect one third of them to fall into uh, the pure yellow and two thirds into the yellow green. Well, what Fisher did is apply Pearson's statistic to this and we find then 359 minus 361 gives negative 2.33, square it, divide by the expected and we get a very small number here. So the Pearson statistic in this case, what Fisher found was 0.0226. Is this a surprising value? 
Well, we can look where it falls on the chi-square distribution. It's got one degree of freedom, only two categories. And it falls way down toward the bottom end. If we calculate it out, and the p-value is 0.881. Now, what Fisher found is that throughout Mendel's data, many of the studies, most of the studies, uh, the, his data fit the, the expectation closer on average than you would have expected by chance. So what, what does that mean? Well, uh, Fisher uh, said something along the lines of speculating that uh, Mendel had uh, over-enthusiastic research assistants. The notion would be that if the assistants knew what the outcome should be, um, that they might have done something to fudge the data a bit. Um, that uh, Fisher's studies have been reported and the reanalysis of it in uh, Novitsky. I've got the reference at the end of this uh, at the end of the video. So, um, some questions to ponder. Uh, an important one to start with is how is the Pearson's chi-square statistic related to the parametric chi-square distribution? And it's important to keep in mind that these are not the same thing. The parametric chi-square distribution is a mathematical distribution, a continuous smooth distribution, of course a whole family of distributions. Pearson statistic is calculated off of our data. It can be kind of choppy. It's not a continuous distribution. Uh, but it does match the parametric chi distribution quite closely when we've satisfied our, our assumptions uh, that the theory is true, that we have random and independent observations and that we have enough observations so that the expected values are reasonably large, say greater than 10. If we have more than two categories, uh, uh, say 10 categories, uh, p many people are willing to let the expected value go down less than 10, maybe even as low as one on occasion, but not less, never less than one, I think, maybe less than five. Uh, on occasion. Uh, you know, it's, it's shades of gray. The bigger, the better. Um, another question. What does a significant p-value indicate? Well, if you find a, a significant p-value, it tells you that your observed frequencies differed from the expected more than one would have expected by chance, a surprising discrepancy. Um, and if we satisfied the assumptions, the interpretation would be probably that theory wasn't correct. Um, but if you didn't have independent observations, maybe that's what's going on. Or if you don't have enough data, maybe that's the problem. A non-significant p-value uh, means that your data are reasonably consistent with the theory. It doesn't prove that the theory is correct. It just means you don't have evidence to reject it. How are degrees of freedom determined? With these goodness of fit tests that we've been looking at, a simple rule is just the number of groups minus one, number of categories minus one. And finally, did Mendel have over-enthusiastic assistance? Well, that's a question for the ages, and I'll leave that to you to ponder. So I thank you for your attention. Here is a, the WISE group from 2013 over the years. I've had many wonderful students to, uh, that have worked on the WISE project, and um, I thank them too. And here are some credits and sources for this particular video.